Hello, welcome you all to the 15th lecture in the Democracy Dialogue series. Uh, the, 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 the lecture series we have started during the pandemic uh, to join the ongoing con conversation around democracy uh, in India and elsewhere. The many leading scholars, uh, activists, public intellectuals have, have participated and addressed this meeting. We have with us Tomila Thapar also, she came last, last meeting. And this evening we have with us uh, Professor Achin Vinayak. He is a leading Marxist scholar and activist. It is a pleasure to have him with, with us this evening. Thank you, Achin, for this. Uh, Prachin, Achin, as Professor Achin Vinayak is a uh, associated with uh, at present Tri-Continental Institute, Tri Transnational Institute. It's a former head of the Department of Political Science, University of Delhi, has authored, co-authored, and edited several books, uh, ranging from uh, the topics ranging from Indian political economy, secularism, uh, and communalism. And his latest book is uh, Nationalist Dangers, Secular Feelings, A Compass for the Indian Left. In this book, book Professor Vanayak, while th theoretically explaining the distinction, distinctive power of nationalism also focuses on how and why the politics of politics and ideology of Hindutva has come to occupy the space it has. He further argues that the path to confronting and defeating this largely unrecognized yet twin challenge of neoliberal capitalism and Hindutva requires the construction of a newer and re-energized Indian left. Today, he will be talking on Secularism, communalism, and Indian politics today. Friends, please welcome Professor Pinai. Um, so I can. Um, hello, thank you, uh, Subhash. Um, I'm um, going to speak on secularism, communalism, and Indian politics today uh, with the help of uh, six slides. And um, the first slide, perhaps you can come to the first slide. We come to that's right, please. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, this is the first slide in which I'm going to talk about definitions, and I'm going to spend a little time on it. This is the most theoretical part of the def uh, of the presentation, if you like, and it is important. So please excuse me if I spend uh, more time on this than on other aspects in which you'll be much more familiar with in the Indian kind of situation. Okay, three very crucial important concepts: secular. Secularization, secularism. So we're looking at this, in fact, they are very crucially influenced by that. What do we understand by the shift from pre-modernity to modernity? In what way is modernity different from uh, pre-modernity? Because a very comfortable way of talking about the past and present is simply to say there's continuity and change, there's continuity and change. Nobody can disagree with such a vague statement. But in one sentence, for me, the distinction between modernity and pre-modernity is simply this. In modernity, the rate, scale, scope, a space, rate, scale, scope, a depth, and continuity of change is profoundly different from that 250 years than they have in all the centuries before that. And human societies have changed in the last 60, 70 years, more than they have in the last 250 years of this day here. This question of time uh, is very important. And therefore the question of change. Take secular. The term secular comes from the Latin word seculaire, which meant a great span of time. This conception, economists talk about secular trends in the economy. Okay, but this concept of a great span of time shifts when Christian discourse emerges. And now the notion of secular, secular time is a little different. What happens in Christian discourse is that you have two kinds of time. You have what is called sacred time, which is God's time of eternity. And you have ordinary time, profane time which is ordinary time, profane time. And these are not two parallel tracks, but sacred time, God's time, 
is of higher importance. And what is more, it intervenes in ordinary time. So that is the earlier concept. What happens with the notion of time? For example, in pre-modern times, well, how did you measure time? You use a sundial, right? Why? Because that was supposed to show you the difference between day and night. The concept of time was cyclical, rhythmic, seasonal. That was agricultural societies and so on. What happens in modernity to the notion of time? Three things. It becomes linear, changing fast, going in a particular direction, forward direction, whatever, complex. Huh? Clock time. It becomes homogeneous. Everywhere, you use the same standards, minutes, seconds, and hours, and everywhere it's the same. It's homogeneous. It's standardized, the notion of time. And the third thing, it becomes more empty. That is to say, the idea of God intervening repeatedly or the uh, spiritual world fades away to a very considerable extent. Linear, empty, homogeneous. Let's take the notion of secularization, which first emerges in 1648 when you had the takeover of ecclesiastical lands by the monarchical state. So that was the first understanding of secularization taken on the lands. But really, the more important developed concept of secularization comes a bit later. And it is, of course, a concept that is connected to this fact of tremendous change. Because in modernity, everything changes to such a great extent, including religious change. And secularization was the registration of religious change. And there were, if you like, three concepts of what this was supposed to mean. One concept of secularization, Sacralization means the declining importance, influence, and power of religious personnel, religious institutions, religious beliefs. That was one. A second conception, there is compartmentalization, differentiation, displacement of religion in society. Hmm? So, for example, this is pretty obvious. There are so many other aspects of modern society, which are not there in the past. For example, we have multiple authority systems, which you didn't have there. Life is much more complex. You have the multiple authority system of education, of, of, of medicine, of all kinds of things that emerge, of mass culture, culture, not just which is folk culture, not just popular culture, but mass culture, which comes with mass communications. And now we are even talking about virtual culture, which comes with new developments, the digital world and so on, et cetera. So you have multiple authority systems, the role and place of religion gets squeezed. Hmm? Economics, capitalism, is it based as in the past in which religious uh, organizations and institutions could have much more importance? Even the legal system of uh, Iran or elsewhere is to a very great extent secularized. The political system, which also rests in new laws because you shifted from subjecthood to citizenship, it's also changed in so many ways. Yes, yes, religion may be influenced and so on. It's compartmentalized. Hmm? Much more space is here. And you have two kinds of understandings of what this means. Uh, those who say that uh, religious decline has taken place and therefore there's compartmentalized. But you have another lot of people saying that compartmentalized doesn't mean that religion has become less important. What is it lost in terms of width, in terms of breadth, it is compensated for by becoming uh, much deeper and more intense. So that's your second understanding of secularization, hmm? in which there are these two differences. A third understanding is that secularization means greater rationality. After all, there was the scientific revolution. Huh? There is a much greater decline in all kinds of ideas of superstitions, myths, God did not create the world in seven days, and this is not how it happened, or whatever. All of these developments take place. And this rationalization takes place even within religious systems, and even within religious. In it's supposed to be a more secularized version of Catholic uh, Catholicism's Christianity, because uh, Protestant does, uh, Protestantism does away with magic, mystery, and mir miracle and connecting that. So you have these three conceptions of secularization related to, of course, modernity. 
but you also have a fourth conception, which is supposed to be the unique contribution of India. And what is this contribution? This con just tolerance. And there is no real difference between secularization, secularism, secular. India, which is this paragon historically of tolerance, of religious tolerance, has always been secular and always secularizations. So there it is not a registration of change, but a registration of continuity. And this idea of tolerance, which is presented by so many people is actually here. Huh? I don't want to get between pre-modern concepts of tolerance and modern concepts of tolerance, which are much stronger in nature. And just to put it very briefly, pre-modern concepts of tolerance have to do with passive coexistence. Modern conceptions of tolerance are connected to a modern development which does not exist in the past. Uh, and that is the discourse of rights, of individual rights and group rights. And therefore, when you talk about tolerance now, it gets connected to issues of minority group rights of all kinds. I'm sorry, it gets breaking away and then I get muted and just think, anyway. Uh, anyway, secularism. Secularism comes in the 19th century, the term origin, uh, originates, huh? Holyoke and Bradlaugh. It's greatly influenced by the scientific revolution. And what happens as a result of the scientific revolution, the enlightenment and so on? Secularism, as the ism would indicate, refers to a new ideology of morals. Earlier in religious systems, the idea of morality was intimately connected to a particular region, a religion and was supposed to be based on some transcendent principle, God-given morality or whatever, a transcendent principle. Yeah. And here in modernity, you have a development, a concept of a universal humanity, a universal humanism, and the notion of secularism now as an ideology of morals is that the, what we should be talking about or concentrating about is the good of human beings everywhere in this world. So secularism becomes an idea of mor uh, ideology of morals related to humans in this world. It's, if you like, addressed to the question, how should we humans live in this world? And of course, as moral beings, we want to know what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. Hmm? And what is a subset of this question, how should we live? And that subset is, how should we, how should we politically live? Politics is that sphere of social life and existence, which is concerned with how we arrive at and give effect to collectively binding decisions and rules. That's what politics is. And once you go beyond tribal society, but even there, there'll be an elders or whatever. Huh? The most important unit is the state, hmm? which then raises the question, what do we mean by the secular state? And what we mean by the secular state is three things. One, the secular state is not bothered about and has no business trying to help you, the ordinary citizen who's living in that state or whatever, to your spiritual fulfillment. And that's not the job of the secular state to help you reach spiritual fulfillment. Second, the secular state must not come under the control, let alone domination of religious institutional institutions, pers uh, personnel, uh, and even beliefs and, uh, beliefs. and third, very important, that your citizenship rights are there, basic citizenship rights given to you irrespective of your religious affiliation. Please do understand that the relationship between secularity of the state and a democratic state, secularism and democracy, is that the secular state is the necessary but not sufficient condition for democracy. You can have secular states which are not democratic. Think of the uh, so Soviet Union, think of China, think of Albania, think of um, uh, many countries, uh, Kemal uh, Ataturk's Turkey. Hmm? They were secular, but not democratic. Yes, 
you have shared rights irrespective of, of, of religion, but those rights are not necessarily democratic. So I think this is an important point that one does have to recognize secularity and relation to necessary but not sufficient condition. Okay. There is often a criticism made about secularism, secularism. You want to attack religion, you want to finish off religion, you're anti religious. No. Secularism and the sec and a secular state is not about separating all politics from religion, but it is about this basic separation of the state from religion. Because everything in so many ways is political, you will have all kinds of groups. What was that point here? Yes, about this whole question of being anti religious. What secularism demands is not that you get away from religion, but that the terms of coexistence between the secular and the religious are, have to be much more modest than they were in the past. That there are domains of existence in which the question of religion is not important and should not have control or influence over. In other words, the terms of coexistence, they, can, they remain, religion has its importance and all the rest, but the terms of coexistence are very different from that of the past. Okay. Religio-political movements. We talk about religious fundamentalism. Fundamentalisms, if you like, are those kinds of movements which want to go back to what they think is the core of their religion in the books or whatever. Hmm? Please note that religious fundamentalists are mostly political, but some are not political. There are religious fundamentalist groups and organizations that turn inwards. And insofar as they turn inwards, for example, they're not interested in the larger world. Think of the Amish. Think of some small sects which turn inwards. Hmm? But most are, of course, politically concerned with the wider world and so on. Religious nationalisms? Well, religious nationalisms are anti-secular by virtue of being religious nationalisms. Many of them are anti the religious Uh, you have Buddhist uh, nationalism in Thailand. It's not necessarily against any other religious uh, other, but it's against the secular other. Huh? Iran, under the theocracy, is not anti the Abrahamic faith of Christianity. The great Satan is the United States of America, not because it's a majority Christian country, but because it's the United States of America and its foreign policy. Right? So that's religious nationalism, but of societies and is necessarily not just anti-secular, but anti some religious other. Hmm? And when we talk about this here, how can I carry on like this? It just keeps on breaking. This has never happened to me before. Anyway, let me try again. Please see if the thing is, I, it's not a problem from this side. Huh? Anyway, the um, communalism Majority minority communalism. Don't make a moral distinction. One is much worse and much bad. No. Hmm? We also recognize that we have to fight against both of them simultaneously. But let us also recognize that majority communalism is more dangerous than minority communalism. Why? The ultimate logic and dynamic of a minority communalism that expands is separation. dynamic of a majority communism is not separation, but domination over the whole of that society, the question of nationalism and taking it over. And therefore, its transformation of the whole of India, for example, is very different from that of a minority communism, even, of course, as we oppose both. Can we go to the next slide? And the full slide, please. Hmm. Very interesting is that what has been happening in India, the rise of Hindutva, is simply a part of something that has been happening worldwide. The rise of the global right, far right and right wing forces of various kinds. Huh? We have had the rise of the politics of cultural exclusivism in four forms from the late 70s, from the 80s. Hmm? So if this is happening on the world scale, shouldn't your first principle of explanation be itself international and transnational. 
it's happening everywhere. And what are the four different forms of what can be called the politics of cultural exclusion? Those which are based on religion, and of course, the whole question of exclusivist nations, nationalisms. And haven't they been taking place since the early 80s, late 70s, in all parts of the world? In what you call the first world in Europe, you've had the rise of racist anti-immigrant xenophobia. Hmm? And now, of course, latest phase, Islamophobia, right? In uh, the so-called second world that used to exist here, huh? you've had nationalist irredentisms, the breakup, the breakup of uh, Yugoslavia, the break Third world, the rise of uh, 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 Hindutva, the rise of uh, Islamic extremism, the rise of Buddhist revanchism, uh, the rise of uh, Jude, uh, Jewish uh, uh, nationalism, Israel, the rise of Christian evangelism, everywhere. These are all forms that have taken place everywhere. What are the basic reasons for this? One, the question of neoliberal capitalist globalization which is the most miserly form huh? and the most cruel form of capitalist development. And this has happened yeah, and has been accepted generally everywhere. What is called the golden age of capitalism with strong welfare states in the advanced world has greatly weakened. And what has neoliberalism globalization done? It has actually led to the most tremendous increases of income and wealth, even as we have mass poverty on a massive scale, mass poverty. Huh? not just in terms of basic needs, but in terms of malnutrition, undernutrition, something like 1.5 to 2 billion undernourished and malnourished people in the world today. And not because there's not enough in the world. And when you have great inequalities of income and wealth, do you think it's not going to affect the nature of democracy? In fact, something very funny has happened since the 80s to liberal democracies or democracies here. Yeah. On one hand, you've had procedural democracy and certain elements of democracy procedures elements expanding to sub-Saharan Africa, elections, this, that, et cetera. But everywhere, the substantive content of democracy has greatly weakened, whether it is in the United States, in Europe, in India, elsewhere here. And of course, one shouldn't be surprised. If you have increasing inequalities, in income and wealth, you think this is not going to affect that? If democracy is understood by popular empowerment, the uh, decline of the welfare state where it ex existed, the weakening of that, the inadequacies elsewhere with a few countries, uh, exceptions with a few countries, isn't that going to create tremendous problems for democracy? And third, ideological disarray. Hmm? How do you cope and hope? What belief systems are going to help you to do that? The triumph of liberalism? Huh? Well, okay, communism collapsed and so on, and therefore socialism as an attractive ideal has uh, ideology has declined. But what is left over there in terms of all that's happening over here uh, in, in Western countries, their democracy weakening, liberalism, all that, how does it help people to cope? In fact, as a result of neoliberal capitalist globalization, there has been tremendous psychic dislocation and disorientation for ordinary people. What does this mean? Frederick Jameson actually summed it up very nicely. He said, what has happened in the world of neoliberal capitalist globalization is that the time space coordinates of a lived experience of your lived of an ordinary person's lived experience the time space coordinates are no longer capable of helping the ordinary person to even understand the much broader time space coordinates of the whole array of forces on a global, national, and regional scale that now shape and constrain their lives. Huh? It's, it's much, much more difficult to understand that over here. And what happens like that here? What happens to identity? What is modernity and what is the relationship between modernity and identity? What are identities? Identities are filters that help you to make some sense of your experiences. And in modernity, you have multiple identities. And the only way to cope with modernity in many ways is to keep on shifting your identity as the prism to which you try to understand things from time to time, depending on your particular context. So sometimes your identity is that of a parent 
and a family, and that's important. Sometimes your identity is that you're in this school, a convent school. Sometimes your identity is a teacher or a doctor or a profession. Sometimes your identity is a Hindu or a Muslim or that. Sometimes your caste identity, sometimes uh, this identity or where you live, the residence, welfare, whatever. And life means shifting birthday in the context of you because life is much more complex. But what happens in psychic dislocation, with psychic disorientation? People want to cling to those identities that are more unchangeable uh, and permanent, that give them some sense of stability and psychic stability. And what are those identities that they try to cling to? Those which are ascribed. But okay, now the point here is that I, the last bit of the slide, where I talked about the specificities of class stabilization, authoritarian national. What do I mean by this? The economic paradigm that is dominant even after the Great Recession, uh, surprisingly, unlike other uh, 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 economic crises, has been neoliberal capitalist growth, which is a rightward shift in capitalist economic uh, capital accumulation. Capitalist accumulation, it's a right wing form and a right wing shift. But this right wing economic shift, which is transnational, has to operate in a world of multiple nation states. And therefore, it needs a political and legal stabilization in order to continue. But this political legal stabilization is necessarily because we live in a world of multiple nation states, nationally specific. Therefore, for example, in Duterte in the Philippines, in Brazil, in Le Pen in France, uh, Trump in the US, there are different ways related to the particular histories and a relationship of forces and politics and all that in those countries by which it stabilizes. And therefore we've had the emergence of all kinds of right-wing, far-right authoritarian populisms from above and below or both. Hmm? This thing here. But please note one thing about all these right-wing authoritarian populisms. They are all to understand. Huh? Why this is so, perhaps we can take it up in the uh, question session. Can we go to the third, uh, the next slide, please? In the whole of it. I don't want to spend too much time because most people will know about this. But when we talk about the Hindutva Sang, RSS and this thing here, at the time of independence, there was something like estimated 600,000 RSS uh, 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 cadres, activists. Hmm? Etc. here, right? But it's really their electoral political breakthrough huh? really begins to emerge from the seventh, mid 70s onwards. First, the, their involvement in the JP movement. Hmm? Emergency gives them a credibility because to give it a, a, a kind of left face, she also, um, Andhra Gandhi also uh, imprisons um, uh, uh, RSS cadres and so on. Their first taste of uh, political power, a central power. Uh, in 1978 at the center as the biggest component of the Janta party. Hmm? And of course that breaks up, Mrs. Gandhi assassinated, Congress comes back with a big, huge majority. And mass movement hmm? in India, post-independence India, comparable, if not exceeding in its sustain, in, in its length of time and all, uh, any campaigns of the national movement period. And what do they do by 1989? From two to 89, they have jumped here, okay? Even then, they have this great breakthrough, which is very important. Even then, they really come to power as the head of a coalition only after the failure of three, if you like, non-Congress, centrist, bourgeois centrist type forces. The Janta Party, none of which last a full term. The Janta Party, VP Singhs, and then of course the uh, UDF, United Democrat, Deva Gowda, and um, uh, what's his name? Um, yeah, the uh, foreign, foreign, uh, foreign minister there, uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but here, so three centrism fail and then they come to power. But when they come to power in 1996, they only last 13 days, right? Why? Because no other bourgeois party is, uh, many bourgeois are not prepared to touch them. They are anti-secular, they are, sec anti -secular. Ah, they are this. What happens two years later? Many of the same parties that wouldn't touch them are now prepared to work with them. What does it indicate? It indicates the shift 
of ground and the shift in acceptability of what the Hindutva forces stand for by 1998. And in 1998, they carry out the uh, Pokhran two explosions, which incidentally is something. Right, now what, let me just say quickly. So then you have, so it's really after the break. In other words, what am I trying to say? You had, if you like, two Germanies, that it is not the rise of Hindutva that ex best, that is the most important, uh, that is an important input into the decline of the Congress. It is the decline of the Congress that is a more important input to help the rise of the, uh, of the Sangh Parivar hmm? and the BJP here. Yeah. But when you compare this far right force with fascist characteristics, many would say fascist, we can leave that discussion and so on. Huh? What is very interesting and what makes it quite different from your Le Pen's and your Duterte's and your Bolsonaro's and Trump's is that you're talking about a far right force in You're talking about a far right force which has the deepest implantation in the pores of civil society. Fortunately, India is a, is a continent, not a subcontinent as big as Europe. Huh? But even so, especially in the Hindi heartland, you have a depth and you have, of course, an expansion and taking place. And please note something else which is very unusual about these uh, BJP Jansang as compared to all other parties, whether it's the mainstream left, whether it is. that has never had a serious split, a major split. CPI, CPI, CPM, different kinds of India Maoists, the Congress party uh, breaks, uh, Loyard socialists, everything here. And of course, you also have, in what we call other liberal democracy, you have here in India much weaker. Uh, What can, anyway, what you also have uh, this thing here over the, in the 70s and 80s is that you have, if you like, Indian politics being shaped by the intersection and cross-cutting impact of six processes. The steady rise up now, uh, some uh, uh, of rise overall of Hindutva, Dalit assertion, the forward march of the OBCs, Muslim ferment. Hmm? In fact, what has happened is that once upon a time, not so long ago, Muslims in South India and Kerala had more in common culturally and otherwise with their Hindu counterparts than either the Hindu or the Muslim there had with the uh, Hindus and, and, and Muslims up north. Hmm? But now what has happened is there's Muslims everywhere. And the most important reasons, one, not so the, the most, uh, the whole question of uniform civil code, but most important of all has been the whole question of communal assaults on that. And that has created a sense of that is there, a Muslim from my concern. We've had the regionalization of the Indian polity with state parties coming up together. And of course, the rise of the reactionary middle class. That has been the process which have been shaping, a cost cutting and shaping Indian politics. is not that important. Or maybe it is important, but yeah, the OBC's forward march, there's been the Hindutvaization of very substantial sections of the OBCs. There has been to a degree of Hinduization of some of the uh, uh, non-Jatav, uh, non-Mahar uh, non uh, uh, Dalits. Hmm. And as for the regionalization of the polity, what we're seeing now is a much greater defederalization and centralization as the BJP expands. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, come down here. When Marxists talk about hegemony, unlike liberals, they have a different understanding. Hmm? Liberals also use the term hegemony, hegemony, all that over here. But when Marxists talk about it, they're very, they're basically influenced by Gramsci. And what does hegemony mean? What does it mean to say that Hindutva forces are establishing a hegemony and hegemony and they are trying to move forward. 
just as one upon a time you could talk about a Congress assembly for some time. Huh? Hegemony in a class context, in a class structured and polarized society and all, means there are three levels. One, if you are to be a hegemonizer and accepted to the ruling class, you have to be able to position yourself as the principal arbiter and be accepted as the principal arbiter between the different sections of the ruling classes. You are the one, and they basically accept it for a variety of reasons. Second, you have to have solid support from the petty bourgeoisie, middle class, and so on, which they have. And third, using sticks and carrots, you have to somehow control over those below. Sticks and carrots in various ways. But since there is always going to be sharp conflicts of material interests and caste interests and conflicts between those at the bottom and the top, to be able to successfully homogenize, you have to both mask these tensions and you have to unify everybody across that. What Gramsci called establishing a national popular will. Hmm? Please note the word national. Again, the whole question of transforming the notion and understanding of nationalism is absolutely central to the whole question of uh, establish, uh, uh, establishing hegemony within the nation state. I'll come back to this later and we can take it up again. What has, are the goals of this Modi era and the Modi regime here? I mentioned four. They're going to keep the electoral system. One can discuss why here, manipulate the EVM, this said whatever here, but basically it gives them the important legitimacy and anyway, again, we talk, their process is to eliminate and subordinate electoral competitors. Should be obvious in various ways to do that. Second, hollowing out democratic institutions and, uh, uh, and, and federalism, just the are all various ways, GST, economically, politically, look at what's happening to the election commission, look at what's happening to, this, uh, to the justice system, all that. I don't have to go on about it. You all know all about it. a whole host of his parliament, joke, everything you can see, uh, the bureaucracy, there's the, all the structures. Here. Okay. The, uh, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, they go after, but of course, uh, primarily uh, Christians, the difference between attacking Christians and Muslims is that Northeast, you've got small groups, leave them alone. Hmm? But within central India, you go after Christians for two reasons. One, because of conversion of tribals and so on, of course you have to go. But the most important thrust against Christians is also against Christian institutions, because although Christians are only two, a little over 2% of the Indian population, 25 to 30% of charitable institutions of various kinds, huh? especially in the fields of hospitals, medicine, and education are there. And they are among some of the best that we have. And although there is a Christian dumb control at the top, they are highly secularized institutions. They're open to everybody, even their teachers and doctors and all are open to, and they, uh, what happens to Christians and they are going to be concerned about Muslims and so on. But yes, you're going after Muslims, how they do that here. Yeah. The fourth plus, of course, is ideological homogenization. What's happening within the media, what's happening within education, what's happening even within Bollywood. Um, and what has happened, a fifth point, is that they have actually transformed the public nature of public discourse in their favor. This is something that has clearly happened as a result of all of these. What is the central nationalist message of the Sangh Parivar? This is a Hindu country. We must make India strong. And because it's a Hindu country, we have to unite Hindus. Which then means, how do you unite Hindus? Well, there are only two ways, not three ways. Just two. You have to find some principle of unification internal to Hinduism. What could that principle of unification be? 
the only serious candidate which is their candidates is a loose and accommodating brahmanism loose and accommodating but still a brahmanism you try to make a you do all sorts of things but you can only go so far with it because of the caste society because of the regional variation this that is but still you do that the other way is external you find some authoritarian right wing far right authoritarian groups everywhere in the world have do this with regard to some significant that way you are more easy to be able to bring everybody despite the differences among hindus and the divisions against that and how do you do that against muslims muslims according to the such a commission are among the poorest people in india they are 13% does any uh, uh, fool believe that muslims are dominating india of course not so how do you build up anger one you play the politics of historical revenge i'll come to that later ah Muslims ruled us there, and that was what was terrible. And this, that. Look at what we suffered, and all that. We go on and on about that. A second grievances. Look, they are being favoured. They are being appeased. Look, the uniform civil code. We've had some reform of uh, Hindu reform law changes in, but they are doing as if the Hindutva forces are concerned about the conditions of, of Muslim women or children or whatever. Of course not. Hmm? But oh, they have something that we don't have. Oh, they. article 370 special favor for the only muslim majority state at the moment because you have relations with the uh, uh, northeast where all christian dominated and they are all very small states and they are all dependent on the center no? you don't go after that and their special land rights and all but you go after that grievances they are, they've got things we don't have huh? and fear love jihad huh? population increase terror You hear the Hindu the lot saying Hindus cannot be terrorists. There is no such thing as Hindu terror. Hmm? And what is the language that they use when they talk about terrorism? And this is done by the liberals and others as well. Islamic terrorism. Have you ever heard of Hinduistic terrorism? Have you ever heard of Sikhistic terrorism? Have you heard of Christianic terrorism? A Buddhistic terrorism? What's my point? All right, there are Buddhist terrorists, Sikh terrorists, Hindu terrorists, Muslim terrorists, secular terrorists. but when you say islamic terrorism you are connecting terrorism to a religion hmm? and actually all kinds of beliefs which take advantage of secular beliefs and and christian and, and religious beliefs inspire and justify it but there is no automatic connection between but you are doing fair terrorism that's terrible that's terrible and of course you have a whole discourse which makes out that what uh, uh, those groups uh, in in kashmir are doing or elsewhere are terrorists but what the indian state is doing in kashmir that's not terrorism what the state did in in gujarat in 2004 that but nobody stops it let me come to the question of nationalism because i've said that nationalism is so central and important and what is the approach of hindutva forces to their construction of indian nationalism i call it the sleeping beauty concept what does that mean hmm? are you familiar with the sleeping beauty story the sleeping beauty story is that there was this wonderful princess who was put to sleep for ages by the evil witch but then the prince charming comes along and gives her the kiss and she awakes what is the hindutva story the hindutva story is that don't you understand that the great beauty of india has been its essential hinduness throughout the ages and centuries but this was put to sleep and now the modern prince charming which are the forces of hindutva will awaken it by giving it the kiss of politics ha ah, but remember that there was an evil witch that put this to sleep what is that evil witch is it the moguls is it the persians is it the turks is it the afghans no it's muslims because when you say muslims you can put all of them together you can add the muslims who came by trade to south india or whatever you like here and that's it and this is the story that's being pushed my point about nationalism is that there are two ways of understanding and it's not just the hindutva lot any number of liberals and others also fall into this trap here from nehru to others and so on here you can either see nationalism as something that is inherited from the past if you see it as something that is inherited from the past there will always be dispute about what is the proper inheritance and who are the proper inheritors 
Hmm? The second way is that Hindu uh, nationalism, uh, which is a modern concept and the nation state is a thoroughly modern concept, even if you try to invent traditions here, is that this nation, uh, nation uh, nationalism belongs to the present and the future. It is what we will make of it. It's an ongoing process. And precisely because it is that, you find that the nation state dies and it, it emerges, all kinds of things. So that's the approach that we should have. We have to fight on the terrain of nationalism to, on the present and future terrain to make it a much more democratic nationalism. But I've added the word but here. Why have I added the word but here? Because we have problems today on a global scale which can only be solved on the global international level. The Marxist tradition which has emphasized the importance of internationalism as central remains absolutely valid. There is no way that we are going to solve the problems of eliminating inequality and mass poverty, of dealing with the uh, threat of nuclear weapons, of dealing with the question of the environment and all that. Huh? Dealing with this global phenomenon of the rise of our act, accept at the now, but we have to reach that by going through a progressive nationalism at home. We have to fight where we are. We have to understand why is it that the nation state remains so powerful here. And I will just end this slide by saying one thing, but let us please remember that even as we fight for progressive nationalism, there are limits to how progressive nationalism can be. There are no limits to how reactionary it can be. Let's understand that very, very carefully. Now let's go to the last uh, uh, slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you accept as I do, mm -hmm. that there is a long-term struggle because the forces of Hindutva, uh, uh, even independent of electoral uh, fortunes, huh, are there in a way that they uh, uh, have established in civil society in a way that is underestimated or not sufficiently estimated by liberals and others. Uh, it's a long-term struggle. And if it's a long-term struggle, what are the long-term crucial actors that you have to rely upon to fight against this? Hmm? And I said, you have to choose between five basic strategic paths or strategic actions. First, array. let's recognize that this is the great evil. We have no choice. Other bourgeois for parties, huh? whatever their problems are, not the, uh, like the BJP song, which is correct. Huh? So we have to try and strengthen these other parties. And here comes the question, what is the role of the Congress? And here you have two directions. Christopher Jaffer others, we have no option but to strengthen the Congress as the hub of another set of forces or whatever to make it here. Then you have the Yogendra Yadav side. Are the, your Congress has a history, it has a past. Let it understand that it cannot be the hub and it should not be arrogant. It should use its past and its experiences all to contribute to develop a new kind of bourgeois, democratic, liberal force, which will have to be uh, do that. So that's your first choice. Your second? India is a country of numerous remarkable progressive movements of all kinds. And this is true. We have remarkable progressive movements everywhere. Rather than focus on these bourgeois political parties, let's focus on bringing these movements much stronger and connecting them. And the problem is that the most important experiment in trying to do this, the NAPM, the National Alliance of People Movement, has not succeeded. And the reasons for this are because when you talk about different movements, they're like different silos, sectors, and the question of how they connect. Again, I can't, I won't go into it now, but it's not worth. What's your third? Are caste is the most important question. The lower caste, not just the Dalits, but the MBCs, the most backward caste, and the middle sections of the OBCs, bring them the majority here, and that will be the force. Caste is the most important thing. And the interesting thing is that among all the Dalit organizations, everybody who talks about Ambedkar and how important Ambedkar is, etc., please notice something. And that is that Ambedkar moved away from the independent labor party and seeking to connect class and class towards ultimately thinking that the only way to get rid of the caste system is to go in for conversion. In other words, what Ambedkar shifted towards a strategy of seeking to escape from uh, uh, Hinduism and the caste system, rather than 
directly confronting it. And what is the end result? Everybody talks about Ambedkar, etc. But the proportion of new converts, new Buddhists, Buddhists who have converted to Buddhism since Ambedkar's time is roughly the same. Little two percent or something. That's it. Hmm? I could say more about this, but that's another matter. We fight against new uh, uh, no fourth, sorry, the fourth part, the existing left. The main thing is the CPI, CPM coming together. That's what I say here. Or another version, the ML, as if its strategy is uh, not, not more than is not, uh, is not a dead end. Countryside surrounding the city, we will come that here. That's one. The fifth is the whole question you do have to build a newer kind of a left. And the sources of that are existing sections of the left, others and all that. You do have to try and build it. And what is meant by three concentric circles that these are not circles that are isolated from each other. They're overlapping. But your three concentric circles are in the core, the question of building a left, connecting and overlapping with progressive social movements. And even at times, if you have to at the electoral other level, you're talking about even working with other non-BJP opposers, et cetera. But the key in many ways is constructing that, even as we struggle to make other connections all the time and so on. Electoral reforms. This first past the post system is a disaster. Electorally speaking, if you had a, some kind of a proportional representation system, huh, there's a huge problem for uh, Hindutva. Hmm? They have a huge problem. But no bourgeois party or even this thing want to go for this thing. Here. Even as they understand its value at the, at the central level, they don't want it at the state level because that would hamper their chances of coming to power at the state level. And yet it is a much more democratic as well as politically long thing. But who's raising it? A few people here and there. Yeah. Eradicating caste, I've already talked about over here. Um, deeper democratization, obviously, in the deepest sense. Please keep in mind the question of a, a neoliberalism. You have to fight against neoliberalism. Its weak spots are jobs and welfareism, certainly. But who's fighting against neoliberalism? All the bourgeois parties, and even the left, uh, mainstream left in power in West Bengal, made all kinds of In other words, if you like, there are, in my view, two distinctions. The far right Hindutva forces are different from the other bourgeois forces who are right wing, but not far right in the same way, even as they're pulled in various ways towards that. There is a difference between these bourgeois forces and even for all one's criticisms, the mainstream left and the, and the Maoist left. There is that. The mainstream left are more and more social Democrats being pulled to the right on economic matters, willing to concede to neoliberalism, but on foreign policy because of the criticism of the United States, more to the, uh, to the left of European social Democrats, which have also moved to the right. But still, yeah. And okay, we recognize these differences over here, but deeper democratization means fighting against neoliberalism. It means the whole question of economic democracy. It means the question of subsidiarity. It means giving more and more power at the various levels, whether it's panchayat levels, other levels and fighting for that here. And I want to say one thing about the difference between the mainstream left and the far left. What, what is common to the far right and the far left and the mainstream left is that their possibilities of success at the electoral political arena is dependent upon what they do outside of parliament and, and the electoral system. They are cater-based forces who seek to implant themselves in civil society. However, the difference between the far right and the mainstream left, let alone the far left, is that when the far right gets substantial electoral support, it is much more acceptable to the ruling class and others than the mainstream left or the far left does. In other words, they can do both and they are doing both. Huh? Use here. But for the far left, the priority is always what you do, etc. It's really your, and the key condition for being able to successfully 
work in civil society is the question of building cadres. And how do you build cadres? You build cadres through ideological commitment, uh, ideological commitment, activism, even more important than ideology, and of course, um, uh, progressive activism and discipline. Yeah. But what is the ideology that the left has? Stalinism? Maoism? A certain sense, the crucial thing. And lastly, I would say that when we talk about transforming and breaking the hegemony of the right or the far right, far right, right here, today, to me, things are really clear here. Please note what happened after two, the Great Recession. Unlike previous capitalist Great Recessions of the Depression or what happened with Keynesianism and others, you don't have a new system to achieve that. You have a return to neoliberalism. You have, for various reasons, but I won't go into here, you have ecological dimension and other dimensions that are taking place over here. You, the relationship of forces which made it possible for neoliberalism and the right and the far right between capital and, and labor, between capital and the working people, the poor peasantry masses and other, shifted to such a great extent that in order for you, of course, we'll fight for reforms and all that, in order for you to be able to change that, you will have to fight even harder in many ways than was possible after the Second World War when working class was mobilized because of war mobilization and others over here, which means that you represent an even bigger shift in relation to forces, which is very seriously threatening to the powers that be. In other words, the question of socialism will necessarily come to the agenda. We have an indication of this in the country that is the most anti-socialist of the advanced countries you have in the United States of America, socialism become respectable in some ways over here. It's an indication, of course, what they mean by socialism moment, but still it's an indication. And for me, in a certain sense, even as we fight at all particular fronts, even as we seek to build cadres and all, the longer term struggle is in fact, we have no real option, even for the ecological reasons and others, but to move away and break cap new, uh, capitalism and the only form of capitalism that we really have now, which will remain, except for compensations. Huh? So whether it's the BJP or whether some, when it comes to, or, or the Congress or other party, when it comes to the uh, neoliberalism, basically, soften it, compensatory, not disciplinary, but breaking capitalism and thinking that you can go back to the older type of developmental capitalism, which succeeded in a few states in Southeast Asia and the third world, or back to the welfareist type of, uh, capitalism is over. You really have to think much more seriously and move in that direction. I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I, I will, I will um, uh, stop here. Uh, uh, and uh, I may have taken too long, but that's also because of all of these interruptions. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Achin. Uh, listening to Achin is always a great, great experience, great experience. And uh, I've not uh, comment on, on, the, on the, the details which he, which he has put forward before us. Uh, we have with us I mean, Professor Romila Thapar, uh, and I would request her to uh, say a few words. Uh, uh, Professor Romila Thapar. Yeah, this is one reason why I don't turn up at these Zoom lectures, because I'm always asked to make a statement and I'm certainly not ready to do so. No, I thought, I thought that the analysis that Achin put forward was really very effective and is something that should be discussed much more in detail. Uh, I mean, I think a lecture like this loses some of its strength because we listen to it and then go away. But now that things are opening up a bit, it might be useful to sit and pick up from all the points that were made and discuss them in far greater detail. I mean, I think, for example, that the analysis that Achin made of secularism, secularization, and the secular 
um, this was extremely useful and, and uh, brings a, a lot of clarity into the discussion of what is meant by secularism. This is something that, that desperately needs to be talked about much more because the general assumption is that, oh, secularism means the coexistence of religions. And so you carry on giving religion the same kind of power and authority that's always had. Uh, but because you allow it to exist and you allow many religions to exist, then that is secular. That's not so. It's a very fundamental difference, as Achin carefully pointed out and as Achin discussed in some detail. Um, so I think that perhaps this issue of what is meant by a secular society is something that, you know, uh, should be taken up more frequently and discussed much more frequently, because unless we're clear about that and the links that secularism has with democracy, which is absolutely fundamental, unless we're clear about that, uh, it can lead to a lot of uh, foggy ideas. And I think that uh, uh, I would suggest that such an carry out some tutorials on these different aspects of what he was talking about. Thank you, Professor Thapar. Uh, uh, would you like to say something, Achin, about it? No. Please. please. Yeah. Uh, well, Achin, uh, really sorry that all these uh, technical glitches have happened Thank you for, for uh, uh, as usual, your incisive and brilliant uh, lecture and uh, uh, analysis. The question I have in mind um, is a question that I often ask, you know, most of our speakers have faced, you know, kind of, I have tried to communicate this question to them. What you are also saying, and I agree with, 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 with most of it, you know, um, what you are also saying that all the forces, all the agencies, um, all the agents who want to damage secular modern politics, secularism, they do various things and they succeed. And also the conditions in the world and the conditions in our country have changed and you have described that also why that facilitates these anti-secular, anti-democratic forces, anti-progressive reactionary forces to do those things. What I do not hear often uh, in most of analysis is that why do they succeed? They, we understand what do they do in order to succeed, in order to damage secularism and other progressive, progressive ideas. What I do not understand is why do they succeed? I do not understand, I shouldn't say. I mean, I would like to underline that why do they succeed? For example, I often give this example of partition, which is blamed variously on colonialism, on Congress, on Muslim League, you know, all of them together. But when partition happened and the riots spread, uh, tend to you know, I mean, one to two million people somewhere, no one knows the number, probably that may be the largest um, riot, people killing each other that has ever happened, you know. It was not organized by the, by the departing colonial masters. The riots were not organized by Congress. The riots were not organized by Muslim League. And yet people rioted, not only rioted in the, uh, in the border areas of Punjab and Bengal, but in Garh Mukteshwar, you know, a, a, a fair, a mela is happening and some rumor starts and within few days, a few thousand people kill, are killed, you know, people kill each other in that mela. So I think that in all our analysis, we do not put our fingers on this subterranean things that exists in the civilizational mind. Why is this, where, or how did this, subterranean tectonic plates that gives rise to, um, in which, through which people are roped into the anti-secular projects of various kinds of agents, whether it is neoliberal globalization or whether it is Hindutva fascists, you know. Um, what do we do about that subterranean 
tectonic plate that is there in our social mind is it there does it play a role i have a feeling that with congress the, with the decline of congress hegemony the democratic politics the electoral democracy became more vigorous and as electoral democracy became more vigorous especially you know due after you know let's say 1980 s especially with mandal and mandir then competitive electoral democracy through that the politics will you know <coughs> will 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 um, you know put its hands in the social mind so to speak and whatever is there in the social mind whatever is favorable to these forces that is brought to surface and that so i find that whatever is there in the social mind in the subterranean tectonic plates that along with competitive electoral democracy you know that interaction um um one has to look at you know and that i often do not find is emphasized enough i do not know what to do about it it's a tough problem but just because it's a tough problem we should not refuse to look at it there is something in our mind in our social mind and when uh, uh, com competing forces come and speak to people people are more likely to listen to what they like at uh, those people who say what they like so people are implicated a social mind is implicated subterranean you know tectonic plates are implicated in this damage to secularism and this does not get emphasized in most of analysis most of analysis you know stays at the level of subjective forces that rss did this or even global neoliberal uh, new neoliberalism i categorize that as subjective forces if global neoliberalism happens why should that make hindus and muslim kill each other in india well let me put it this way it's a difficult i don't know if i'll be able to address your question anyway adequately but it does stimulate certain thinking in my mind one is that i've emphasized something um, and that is i've emphasized this whole question of psychic disorientation hmm? and this is something that one has to try to understand why is this the case i want to bring in if you like uh, two or three uh, themes one is the question of psychic disorientation second why is it that nationalism is so important as distinct from other forms of belonging okay and third is the fact the ideological disarray and the absence of any kind of confidence that there's any alternative if you like three things let me take the first point here i emphasize the question of universal humanism right and universal humanity but the only way of being part of the human race is by being a particular human being okay what does this mean the idea of being a particular human being and every human being has certain fundamental questions they ask themselves who am i and where do i belong because we have to situate ourselves in so far as we are cultural beings which we are cultural beings being a cultural being means that we have to sit we have the capacity for transcending space and time huh in two questions which are crucial to us is who am i and who do i belong to right there are multiple answers to this huh i'm a hindu i'm a sikh i'm a class this class i'm that class all the rest of it fine yeah but remember i pointed out here that what this psychic dislocation does is that you seek to grab on to those identities that are permanent and unchanging hmm? please notice the whole question about uh, the politics of culture exclusive and the domination of different kinds of identities and therefore identity politics which seem much more important than say class politics hmm? and they take a negative form this identity part so now the question is that even these identity politics which i've talked about here why is it that nationalism is so powerful why is it that all these authoritarian populisms are authoritarian nationalism in fact i make a point i want to make a point here nationalism is the most powerful form of belonging it is more powerful than religious identity or religious belonging hmm? in fact when there is a clash between your religious belonging and your national belonging the religious belonging loses out 
no matter how much you have islamic groups talking about the caliphate huh that's not going to succeed in terms of bringing together people within their own this thing two shia majority countries fought the sec second longest war of the 20th century iran and iraq hmm the muslim pakistan is divided into i'm sorry afghanistan divided into tribal groups that are fighting with each other and the fact that they are muslims is not the most important thing right why is it that they take the form of nationalism why is it that these forces we are fighting have operated successfully on the terrain of nationalism what is the power of nationalism which makes it even greater and here i feel like uh, than other forms of belonging because we need to feel uh, belonging to what gives the national community greater strength than the religious community so when it it's not enough to be a hindu and say hindus must come it has to be hindu nationalism it has to be there yeah and here the answer in many ways is this nationalism is uniquely empowering to ordinary people in a way that other forms of belonging are not ben anderson actually made this point in his own way he said that religion is an imagined community you have all kinds of imagined communities and imagined communities are those communities beyond the face to face community so you have different kinds of imagined community but what is it about the imagined community of the nation that makes it different and he pointed out very carefully it has replaced religion as the most powerful thing here but unlike religion which is an imagined community the nation is an imagined political community what does it mean to say that it's the political dimension that gives it power and here's something you said which is very interesting you emphasize the whole question of electoral politics and democracy why is it that today's authoritarian far right cannot be like hitler or mussolini and just eliminate the electoral dimension because in fact the electoral dimension has got tremendous appeal because it's one minimalist form of in accountability and power that ordinary people have to hold to some account here in other words what nationalism has and the emergence of the citizen nation is two powers which are both horizontal the shared aspect of being shared citizens no longer subject <coughs> and having therefore a kind of equality <coughs> regardless of class status and others which is an empowering thing and the second is the vertical dimension of some kind of accountability of those who power, uh, rule over us over a uh, Um, uh, uh, to us, so even dictatorships in Pakistan elsewhere can no longer say, as in the past, that the state is the patrimony of my clique or my family. It's a state, and we are ruling even as a dictator for your benefit. So, unlike religion, which has its own hierarchy or whatever, the, in the nation you have a kind of sense of empowerment which no other sense of community gives. there were attempts to go beyond the nation the strongest attempt to go beyond the nation was the eu and it has failed the eu is an intergovernmental agency and a federation of nation states very interesting the nation state remains absolutely crucial and central because it is the most important political unit in which ordinary people still feel some degree of empowerment and in india very interestingly huh, is that you have um, more Uh, involvement of people in electoral politics the lower down you go national level turnout uh, state level local level hmm? it's still a very very important uh, this thing here but the prism through which they see this importance of elections empowerment and all huh? they are clinging on to something that gives them power even though the nature of democracy has in fact gone uh, substantively gone down much weaker so obviously we have to fight on this particular terrain but how do we fight against the whole uh, the hold of um, uh, religion and all that and my own view is that in fact if you are able to defeat neo liberalism and expand welfare regardless of uh, the material conditions regardless of religious orientation this itself will have a powerful effect even in the case of our hindutva forces they know and we know and everybody knows that their weak spot is the economy but even though that is their weak spot huh, it's not enough and this is where the question of alternatives come from what do the other parties offer 
what is it that they will offer in terms of either foreign policy or economic mm-hmm. policy that is different some benefit compensatory aspects over here which even modi is prepared to give some just that etc here right where is your alternative secondly people need to be able psychically need to be able to hope for they want to both do they want to do two things they want to hope and they want to cope hmm? earlier belief systems were able to address this in some way hmm? socialism was the most powerful like a religion which gave enable people to cope and to hope look at the difference between the interwar period and today in the interwar period when fascism was triumphant in europe and the uh, and the and the socialist movements were being finished you know what people said who were socialists huh? they said don't worry i mean okay we are losing but the future belongs to us we will keep on fighting when we talk about cadres and we talk about ideological commitment and long term struggle people are willing to fight not because they think that we will necessarily win in this generation but our future generations will very central to the whole question of ideological commitment is the question of ideological morale right so there in the fascist period the left was saying the future belongs to us who on the left today says that the future belongs to us can they say it after the disasters of stalinism and maoism can they say it after the absence of alternatives provided even by the mainstream left and others and they are here huh? so you are going to have huge problems there and you have a much more shift in the relative forces you have a determination of the ruling classes to be able to f- fight there it cannot simply be done by uh, the rationality of one's argument uh, gramshi made a very important point when he said about ordinary working people he said they have a stretched consciousness on the issues that are close to them with their involved their uh, their uh, their, jo- their factory their school this that etc they are not necessarily going to listen to the bullshit that comes from uh, the government or from the modi or from the hindutva lot they say no no we know what is happening to us over here and we will go on strike and don't tell us we shouldn't do this etc here yeah. but the further away issues are for them huh the more they will be influenced by what the media says whatever says hence the importance of that what is bringing about a radical change here? it's what is the whole importance of having a kind of uh, a, a vanguard party what is the uh, a party and so on here yeah. it is to actually be an institutional framework in order to bring about a much more totalizing consciousness which is not possible for any one person to have but by having an organizational framework in which the experiences and understandings of the uh, of people can come together the idea of a vanguard party as i've often pointed out is the counterpart to the vanguard formation of the bourgeoisie today the sang parivar which is deep in society has now captured the state apparatuses what is the state the state is the most important vanguard agency of the ruling classes and caste because it centralizes the experiences and understandings of our oppressors in order to have a much larger vision than any of the individual interests or the individual capitalists etc how how best to sustain this process hmm? we have to do the same thing in order to fight against the state we have to have a mechanism by which we are able to centralize the experiences and understandings of different people so that that participant taken here huh? the great strength of the bjp sang parivar unlike that of of of, of marxists and leftists is that we need a totalizing vision right they don't need to have a, i mean they have, what they do is they have a very simple vision huh? make hindu strong hmm? that's why you can have ideological cadres who are last uh, the same because they don't have to they, they the responsibility on them to think deeply about other issues is not there everything is laid down but the problem for uh, leftists and marxists is that you do have to have a much larger vision and to develop a vision how are you going to cope with this kind of psychic uh, uh, isolation psychic uh, Uh, siloing of thinking this is the most important uh, pris- uh, prism for you to think about identity politics and all hmm? and how do you sustain morale 
you sustain morale if you are able to at least develop thinking that look we are losing here but we are gaining here look at what they are doing what we are doing here huh? and that of course is the real this and that can only come through activism and through recognizing the uh, uh, what do you call it problems that the, the left has had here the difference between the fascist period and now is that whether you were a Stalinist or later after Mao Zedong comes to power, you're a Maoist, you still said the future belongs to us. This is the way forward. Huh? Now there is huge ideological disarray, which is a bigger problem for the left even than it is for the right. Huh? And you cannot overcome this ideological disarray except by trying to build this cater the forces and through particular activism, because what does activism do? It shows ordinary people that yes, you can change things. So if we are able to do what the Sangh Parivar others do, have implantation so that you can fight and build confidence and coherence collectively. Hmm? That's the important thing. Gandhi's idea of change was fundamentally flawed. Gandhi's idea of change is that the, uh, the processes of uh, uh, raising group consciousness are basically the same as the process of raising individual consciousness. Hence the whole idea of Sarvodhya. Hence him making his own body uh, a personal laboratory had some influence. But his idea was that we have to, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, what, what was the word um, uh, that they use? That we have to uh, be, uh, I'm sorry, I had all the name, this thing. But yes, we must be the exemplars uh, uh, of this thing. And that will change this thing. The processes of group change are not a simple addition of the processes of individual change. They require some collective formations to be able uh, to, uh, to bring it about. And it's going to be a long-term thing. And we don't have, we have to build that morale, which, uh, and this is in fact the biggest difference between the earlier periods when there were so many defeats and now. So we don't have to worry about capitalism screwing things up and people getting angry and upset, but where do they go? In fact, one of the most worrying things now is that we are going to have an ecological devastations. Forget about uh, not crossing to uh, two, two centimeters, forget about 1.5. How are we now going to stop crossing to uh, two degrees? And you know what's going to happen in India, which of course is a peninsula surrounded by water. There are going to be huge problems over there. And you know what is going to be the response of the rich and the powerful to create a bigger fortress and to use force in much way. Hmm? That there will be anger against that, uh, the, this neoliberalism, and all that is clear. The difference between the, uh, the, the left populism and right wing populism is right wing populism says, look at the negative economic effects, but they are not going to challenge the rulers. They are using it in order to die here. And they are mobilized, they are strong for a whole uh, host of reasons. But if we can fight to make uh, breakthroughs, make change, and there is, of course, writing talks about that, etc. Yeah? Uh, but uh, I, I, I cannot uh, be certain about the future. But what I can say, it has become more necessary, even as it seems <coughs> more difficult and remote, it has become more necessary to fight for socialism than ever before. Sorry, I a longish response, but you did stimulate all kinds of ideas. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Mutinsen, and for this uh, very highly thought-provoking lecture. And I want to read a question from chat box. Uh, this question is um, posed by um, one Mr. Vamsi Surapogu. Uh, question is like this. Do you think the failure of lower caste parties to establish themselves as national parties helped the rise of Hindutva. I mean, they failed to build an alternative to both Congress and BJP and failed in generating a counter hegemony on the principles of social justice. Is it the main problem? It is That's one question. problem, certainly. I would say that there are many more problems, but one problem, certainly. And of course, one of the biggest problems of the lower caste, etc., especially of the Dalits, huh? is that they're never gone, then be, be able to go beyond the first stage. What do I mean by that? One of the biggest mistakes that the left and Marxist parties, left parties made with regard to the lower caste, 
is it saying to them, yeah, you have to fight for socialism, join us and work with us, and that will succeed. Your problem is there, but once we have a socialist society, it will disappear, etc. In order for people to be able to come out and fight, they must have a sense of dignity and self-worth. What the black nationalist movement did, black nationalism, I was part of the anti-racist struggle in England, huh? was that instead of white dominated left groups saying you black and white unite and fight, huh? we and the fighting, they say, well, what about our particular oppression? And we were very much attracted by black and proud. Black is beautiful. This thing here, be proud of being black, be proud of being Dalit. What the Dalit organization did was asserting Dalit this as something to be self-worth, self-proud. This is your first step but you can get trapped in it completely. Huh? You have to go beyond that. And that is something that they've never done. For example, the near majority of Dalits in India are landless laborers. But the majority of landless laborers are not Dalits. If you want to make a serious uh, material breakthrough in the condition of Dalits, you have to have a cross-caste um, 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 uh, cross class alliance. Who's thinking about that? Ambedkar gave up on the ILP, which was much more class-based uh, towards this escapism here. What has happened as a result of this is the same thing that has happened to the black struggle in the United States. You have a rising middle class because the struggle against discrimination, right? Moves in one direction, social advancement upwards, social mobility upwards, and to discrimination, this thing here. Huh? It's not a struggle against capitalism as such. And capitalism foundationally class-based huh, remains something that becomes very, very, very uh, 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 crucial in order to make more fundamental answer. Instead of what you have, you have more and more blacks of the middle class. The inequalities between blacks and middle class are, uh, what do you call it, uh, less and less. And, uh, and the blacks and upper class, many blacks listening here, you are simply having a, sim a similar Dalit middle class or a lower caste uh, middle class, even upper sections, slower this thing here. And that becomes the dimension. It becomes a question of identity politics. Let me take, for example, the gender question. Hmm? Gender oppression predates class oppression. Gender oppression is more universal than class oppression. It exists within classes. Ruling classes, right? In the 60s and 70s, what did we think? We said, listen, the feminist movement is telling us correctly that gender oppression is more universal and deeper historically than class oppression. It's more, and we said, yes. And therefore, we said that if there is reduction in the material inequalities between the genders, this will naturally lead towards reduction of material inequalities between classes because gender repression is more universal. What has actually happened? Within classes over the last 30 years in the advanced countries and elsewhere, the inequalities of income and power between the genders has decreased. But the inequalities between classes has increased. Hmm. It's something to understand. When we talk about race, and when we talk about gender, and when we talk about class, hmm, class I can take for separately, what is the difference between race, gender, and class? We fight for equality across races. We fight for equality across gender. We do not fight for equality along classes. We want a class-less society. We don't want in the same way a raceless society or a genderless society. We only want the discrimination to end there. Hmm? The logic of that kind of a fight is very different from the logic of the fight for class. Secondly, the relationship between capitalism and these other oppressions is one in both in which affect each other. Definitely, but it is asymmetric. What does it mean to say asymmetric? To say it is asymmetric means that the class relations, if you like, have a stronger influence on other oppressions than they have on that as a generalization. 
even though they have an equation like that. Hmm? The women's movement says that when you talk about capitalism, huh, have you forgotten the importance of social reproduction? In fact, if there are not people able to give birth to people, you go on about the social relations of production. What about the relations of social reproduction? They're quite right. It's very, very important. But what's the, what's the, what's the connection? Or what's the relationship between the relations of production and the relations of social reproduction? In the relations of social reproduction, apart from one crucial factor, which is giving birth, because without giving birth, how are you going to have a new working class, right? The other dimensions of the relations of social reproduction are crucially shaped by the changes in the relations of production. Because when you talk about social reproduction, you're not just talking about giving birth, you're talking about nurture. You're talking about development. And the relations of nurture huh? and all that yeah, are much more crucially related to the question of class relations. And the thing about capitalism is that capitalism is much more flexible than pre-capitalist uh, forms uh, of, of, of ex uh, exploitation and oppression. And therefore you have something which you did not have in the pre-capitalist class. You now have a variety of family structures. Hmm? In fact, what is important for capitalism is not the family, but the household. The household must be there in order to help capitalists. Develop. But the household can take any kind of form now. And you're seeing this in the Western society. And you can see this, but it doesn't alter the, uh, on, by itself. Uh, crucially, they say, yeah. So you can see unmarried people staying together. You can see uh, women, of, uh, people of the same gender. You can see males and, and this thing staying together. You can have only a male taking care of the children. You can have all kinds of relationship because what is important is that the household responsibilities be done for capitalism. But you have complete flexibility within that to be able to do this, this uh, very, not sorry, complete, not sorry, not complete, but very substantial flexibility to be able to do that, et cetera, here. So what does it imply for us? It implies that, and, and please understand, the majority of oppressed women, the majority of oppressed castes, the majority of an oppressed nationality, the majority of um, uh, oppressed uh, 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 people who are oppressed uh, religion, culturally, et cetera, they are all part of the broadly understood working class. You cannot unite this working class without taking up all of these oppressions and fighting against them. You have to, to do that. Huh? But you have to connect it steadily towards uh, 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 class struggle and there. One of the problems about the NAPM type of this thing over here is that they are trying to bring together different silos, sectors of oppression together. To fight, and you can say you are also wanting to fight capitalism, etc. But that is not the way in which you develop a much a body of much more collective consciousness. Hmm? What I have tried to say is that uh, the we have had three um, um, uh, collective um, um, sort of collective bodies that we have had to struggle with: nationalism and 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 capitalism, right? But uh, uh, what I'm going to say is that, uh, no, let me just uh, uh, rethink this here. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, we have to connect. And this comes back to uh, your point, Ravi. How do we connect the individual struggle to the collective struggle? How do we connect these individual struggles or even these sexual struggles to the collective struggle? Historically, so far, we have only found three forms that this is taken. The forms of collective, which have had success in bringing the individual struggle into the framework of a larger collective struggle, which encompasses them. And what are those three uh, uh, forms of collective struggle, which has shown themselves to be successful in incorporating that? One, nationalism, national liberation. Two, um, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, democracy. Hmm. Three, socialism. These have been the three ways in which you get here. What is the most important organizational form to help bring this about? Now the area of nationalism is this thing we have to fight against it progressively. And all. What is the most important organizational form for it? You have different understandings. A network. Hmm. Or 
historically the most important form have been political parties for the socialists and others don't think so much in terms of having one socialist party which is going to be the most important thing because the working class defends you but you do have to have why a party structure is more successful than simply a movement structure and this thing why why is the cadre this thing here think of the hindutva forces if it wasn't for the rss and its tentacles everywhere which of course is now shared in all the rest of it and you have problems but they're all there etc etc could you have had this thing here a cadre uh, was here so i come back to the question of cadre huh and i come back to this question of how to if you like connect the struggles against individual and sectoral oppression in a larger coherent framework which people will say because during the national liberation movement specific struggles against individual sectoral oppression must say oh we must fight to get the british out because that will be a great step forward in fighting against what we're doing so really to huh so if you like the struggle against capitalism for a social order is again the necessary but not sufficient condition for fuller emancipation so i mean i'm again you are being very kind you're letting me go on and go on you should tell me to shut up sometimes also huh Anyway, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, there is another question in the chat box uh, by Devi Prasad Chaudhary. Grassroots organization do conduct dialogue with the people, voters, and that is the main ingredient in their work. How can this be performed without religion? Uh, anyway, that, that, yeah. Well, of course they can perform without religion. Uh, one, of course, remember that grassroots organizations have not been successful electorally. again you have the example of the napm and they have tried to stand uh, up as candidates people who have been very courageous and remarkable leaders in local struggles and it's not really worked what is it about elect uh, electoral politics in a certain sense that makes it so uh, uh, different here electoral politics is basically for the vast majority of people who are not necessarily involved in struggles everywhere or everything is that electoral parties try to tap the existing consciousness of people Hmm. what i said about the far right and the far left and the mainstream left is that these are two forces unlike bourgeois parties bourgeois parties do you, these days it become very popular worldwide the prashant kishore type of this thing do the surveys to find what people think huh and appeal to that okay you can do a little bit of fiddling here you can say this thing here but that is your way to win elections huh the far right and the far left and this want to change the thinking there in a much more progressive direction which you can't do with elections you have to do it through struggles in society which then change the consciousness here there etc by which you can also propel yourself um, uh, 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 electorally which of course is uh, is is a is a, is a different uh, ball game huh? and uh, this question about um, uh, grassroots organizing being electoral what about can they do without religion people grab on to what it is here i've already given you example here even those who are very religious are saying we want decent health care we want this education we want this that etc right but if you are not able to provide it huh then what the hell are they going to expect them to do if you are not able to give a serious alternative what are they going to do in fact do you know the way to actually undermine the uh, uh, the 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 religious hostilities and tensions between different communities etc one you do the battle of ideas yeah yeah etc huh? but the most successful way to do would be to be able to universalize welfare if you are able to universalize education if you are able to universalize welfare if there's a thing here and decent high quality what does it mean it means hindus and muslims come together they do this they get that they become doctors they become this thing they get equal benefits they are, they are regardless of their religion and all the rest of it and things are better 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 for everybody over here it doesn't mean that religious differences will disappear but of course it's going to make a huge difference the rss implantation in civil society builds loyalties with people and they build loyalties not simply because of their ideology or the shakas 
but because they also materially help people. 800 NGOs that are doing all kinds of work, hmm? progressive works they have. They're building, they have the largest private network of schools in the country, which provide this thing here. They have the biggest uh, a set of lawyers in the country. Hmm? They will help you and your family to get a doctor if your child is ill, or they will help you to uh, get a job somewhere and that. And now because they're in the apparatus as a power of state, they're able to do more. In other words, when they have that, you have a basic sense of loyalty to them. And that loyalty is not based necessarily on deep commitment to their ideology even, but is based and is strong. In fact, even the left had loyalties from different people. Yes, yes, ideology, this, that, et cetera, here, all that, fine. But also because of these material benefits. So I'm not saying that we don't fight at the level, we fight for democratization, huh? we fight for uh, subsidiarity, for participatory budget at the panchayat level, because this is where the people feel. All these struggles take place and they give sense, people a sense of empowerment and they give them a sense of greater future possibilities. Huh? And they give greater morale. And they have said, and these are the things that one uh, uh, really has to do, which it comes back again to the whole question of them, in my view, of uh, building cadres, a, new, uh, a newer construction of a left, uh, and progressive and working with uh, other forces and all, all that. Huh? But what I've given is a very general outline, right? Please remember that I'm a Marxist, so I could be wrong about everything. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> CP Jha has raised his hand. Can you, can you share your question, Mr. CP Jha? Chandra Pakaj Jha. Yeah. Please be brief, please. Uh, please, please go ahead. Uh, my simple question is, uh, actually there are two questions, I merge both of them. I heard you about household, okay? Mm. And I've also heard about uh, a student from JNU doing a research, in fact, she's done PhD. Uh, and she has uh, 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 taken a new uh, thesis that uh, nowadays what operates is not productions, relations of production, but consumptions. So that brings me to correlate about your notions of household to her thesis. I haven't read her thesis. First thing is that. Second, will it be correct to understand that you hinted about a post-capitalist society, post-capitalism, pre-capitalism and all that? I, I request you to please clarify on these two. That's all. Okay, with regard to the question of consumerism, what has actually happened is that uh, this also is connected to the whole question of, in my view, ideological disarray. And uh, uh, what happens is that, uh, uh, is that people's sense of getting some, uh, people's idea of ordinary people's idea of having some sense of self-worth, of, uh, of, of doing better in their lives, huh? gets connected to the question of consumption in a capitalist society in so many ways. If you're able to consume more, you're better here. There's a positive aspect about this, and of course, if you're very poor here, but there's also this aspect of your being entirely focused in that direction, and that being the thing that gives you a sense of uh, a greater sense of achievement, if you like, here. And that is something that is actively cultivated by all the forces of capitalism uh, and the state in various ways, not just for able to sell stuff and to make profits, but also, of course, to individualize, atomize. Uh, people and of course this is very uh, sure people have to learn a living in some particular way there are always risks that are involved in in, in collective activity huh? and uh, you are not going to get people very practical people in a certain sense uh, saying is that why should I take the risk this is a problem of what is called free riding here you want to build a union to fight for better wages against uh, the, the owners of the of the firm Right now, if you start organizing and fighting and striking again, you are taking big risks. Huh? But those people who take risks may suffer. But if they succeed, the benefits they'll get will also go to those people who are not taking the risks, who are part of the uh, uh, working class. There'll be higher wages for everybody. It makes very concrete, practical, rational sense for many people to be free riders. 
in order to counter this, you do have to take up the whole question of building morale, ideology, and all. It makes very great rational sense to be a writer. Why should I take the risks? Uh, if they lose, at least I'm saved. Huh? And if they win, I get the benefits anyway. Hmm? So, I mean, that's one rationale. Uh, on the question of uh, 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 pre capitalism, I only meant that um, there's a question about the relationship of modernity to capitalism. Hmm? And you have basically two broad understandings of how modernity emerged. One is a predominantly cultural identity, uh, understanding of uh, how modernity, cultural theories of modernity. And the others are what are called acultural theories of modernity. Acultural theories of modernity don't dismiss the question of culture, but they give much less weight to that uh, uh, dimension for understanding the emergence of capitalism. Cultural uh, uh, theories understanding uh, Charles Taylor that it's really the emergence of individualism. Weber, the Protestant ethic, explains it. But then once the capitalism emerges, of course, it's not the process as it is so important here. Marxists and all say no. In fact, the breakthrough came as a result of the emergence of capitalism in the economy. Brenner's thesis, if you like, and variations of Brenner's thesis, uh, uh, if you like, here. Yeah. But it's connected to the question of um, culture and what you have among postmodernists huh? and post-structuralists, if you like, is a much, much more emphatic emphasis on the question of culture. Hmm? So, for example, you will find that when they are talking about how to do things in India, we have to fight on the culture. Yes, yes, of course, you have to fight the ideological level. Let's go back to the uh, take the best of India's past. Let's talk about Gandhi. Uh, that uh, etc. You notice that I was emphasizing that even if we fight the battle of ideas and these ideas, etc., the material dimension of much greater welfare, jobs, fighting against things is very, very uh, important. What they say is, look, we are all cultural beings, correct? And we are cultural beings, but we're not just cultural beings, we're also physical beings. That culture rests, if you like, on a physical being here, on a physical aspect. And they say, postmodernist, culture goes all the way down. Culture is human nature. Hmm? Marxists and others say no. There is a gap between culture and nature. And that gap is filled by another concept, which is called nurture. You have to survive once you're born. Huh? The material in which you are nurtured. Huh? is crucial in understanding that. Huh? And what is common to a whole human species, if you like, are at least two things. Hmm? One, a deep concern for your physical well-being. Survival. Huh? Physical well-being, very important. And second, a minimal rationality. A minimal. In fact, all of us are comprised of a minimal rationality, Minimal basic needs, minimum needs, minimum emotions, hmm? minimum uh, 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 rationality. And what this means is that we are able to learn from each other and we're able to learn from, uh, from other cultures. And please remember what I said about modernity and the whole question of culture being so rapidly changing and the forms of culture dramatically changing. So of course we have to intervene on the cultural sphere Hmm? But let us not make the mistake of saying that this is the key way we come back to the question of capitalism. Identity struggles tend to be much more struggles about dignity, about self-worth. This is very important. Remember, I said that that's even a first step. I was part of the anti-racist black nationalist movement, angry with the predominantly white thing that said black and white. And I said, what about my oppression? But I also came to realize that there are limits. You can't just be stuck all the time. Look at what's happened with the caste situation. Where is the disappearance of caste? Who's fighting for the elimination of caste? And why should they? Now caste assertion is one way in which you can get certain benefits and that becomes also the crucial here. Remember? Yeah. The difference, of course, between caste and race and, um, uh, and gender is that race and, uh, and gender are not in themselves analytical categories. Huh? But class is, at least the Marxist conception, not the Weberian conception. What does this mean? For Marxists, 
class is automatically a relation of exploitation. To eliminate exploitation, you have to eliminate class difference. Race and uh, gender are categories which are static about differentiation. That's it here. Huh? You don't want to eliminate ra races, uh, races. You want men uh, and, and, and women to do this thing here. Yeah? Even on the question of uh, culture, what you're really talking about when you talk about culture is greater respect, greater equality. Yeah. This that I, ask, I ask one, just one. Yeah, sorry. Writer. Uh, will it be correct to understand that the, even in uh, uh, post-capitalist society, when the state will be there away, all that, classes will exist in some way or the other way. Sorry, sorry, could you speak a bit louder? You see, I, my, my question is, sorry, I'm in a village, no, no, no. Uh, very, so sound may not be very correct. My question oh. is that, uh, observation be, uh, uh, based on the observations uh, about what you said about household. I, I talked about Professor Sir Teaching of Plati Shiram College in Delhi, who has done research from JNU Political Science mm -hmm. about the consumption being the consumption suits capitalist class. I, I understand. And you are talking about household. Okay, so instead of families in traditional form, my question is that in view of all these inputs, that will ever, ever in post-capitalist uh, uh, society, when there is capitalism, will uh, be uh, state will be there, where there will not be state. Capitalism will survive in some way or other way in collaboration with classes. Please uh, tell me so that I can uh, um, uh, translate in simple language for the readers for which I write in basically in Hindi. Thank you. Well, the point is this thing is that let us make a, a, a difference in a post-capitalist society. Of course, what you mean by post-capitalist societies is not the post-capitalist societies like <coughs> communist China or the Soviet Union, which were post-capitalist societies, but basically societies that were in transition. And the transition failed. They went back to capitalism hmm? for various reasons. One won't tie into that. I think what you mean by post-capitalist is actually a successful defeat and overthrow of capitalism. Yeah, and <laughs> simple to my understanding, the, uh, the state will have no say in running the world affair. The country. Here, I think what we have to understand something the state, here, uh, which we we knew in the post World War uh, One. Mr. Jha, please, please no. don't please don't no, interrupt. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. I understand. I'm just, I'm just clarifying. The withering away of the state. Sorry, sorry for sorry for the, that. The that, concept uh, of the withering away of the state <coughs> was a very facile one a very okay. facile assumption <coughs> by both uh, Marxists and anarchists. Their hearts were in the right place. They want it. The best way to look at it is that you can have the elimination and you must have the elimination of a caste state, but you will still continue to have some kind of public authority. Huh? And certain differentiations of power <laughs> which you must control by the maximization of accountability and control from below. Let me put it uh, 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 a difference here between Bavarians and Marxists in one simple sentence. You cannot do away without the differentiation of functions, including experts. Huh? Barbarians and others say that once you have a differentiation of functions, <coughs> you will, uh, 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 a social division of labor. Hmm? Yeah. And there will be a social division of labor, even in a post-capitalist society. This will necessarily lead to significant power differentials, i.e. classes. What Marxists, the best tradition, not just Arnold and Marx have said, is that don't confuse the unavoidable social division of labor with some kind of corresponding or strongly related social division of power. You will continue to have differentiation, which means that the kind of democracy you will have in a post must be deeper and stronger than that, anything that is possible in bourgeois, which is absolutely correct. The tragedy 
of the Stalinist and the Maoist traditions was that unlike traditions of council communism, Trotsky tradition, other traditions, etc., they didn't bother about this, this thing here or whatever difficulty is this thing here. here. There has been the banner has been kept up by that, uh, the truly democratic, which have always argued. And therefore, the question of fighting for democracy, which I also said, deeper democracy and others here, with regard to the question of the household, one thing is very clear here. Does the household have to be the central uh, um, um, uh, unit for uh, having social reproduction? What not we see all kinds of histories, even in the earlier period of the Bolshevik revolution, of very collective and cooperative forms of crash, of laundry, of healthcare, of kitchens, of this, of that, and all that. We even saw this in the 60s and 70s with attempts by this. But what they did in the framework of capitalism was they created certain islands, which became, if you like, uh, uh, examples of escape from capitalism, rather than part of a struggle to fight against capitalism. Mm -hmm. But that deeper democracy, which is effective, will be something that we have to fight for. And we will, I mean, we are there. Yeah. Now, as uh, Rosa Lakhman said, it's socialism or barbarism. The necessary struggle is there. Whether we succeed or not, different. Look at the ecological problem, look at other problems there. But I hope that this uh, does uh, uh, address the question of democracy becomes absolutely central. Huh? Yeah. The question of the withering away of the state as a class state, yes. The uh, uh, complete elimination of some forms of public authority. Huh? And therefore, some degree of differential responsibility in power, this, that, et cetera, especially on the more collective level. No, but minimize it. Right there. The other question that's related to this from what we've learned from history is the question of the role of a market. Do you completely eliminate the role of a market in a close capitalist society, or is it to be subordinated tremendously uh, here? In spite of computerization, etc., can you talk about uh, a, a centrally planned economy, which is based uh, on government? And you have, of course, different currents who say that. Some say that it's a social market, market under the control. Others say that, in fact, don't worry, with computerization, we can do complete uh, this thing here, etc. But, I mean, that's the other dimension. Okay. Okay. Uh... It's getting late, but can I sneak in a supplementary to what I was saying earlier, Achin? Yeah. I would like to um, know what you would say if I were to say that it appears as though actually existing working class jumps from um, far left to far right. It jumps over the middle. What I mean is that, for example, if you take the example of Rust Belt in America, you know, either the, when the trade union politics and Bernie Sanders may or may not have been in those times, but Bernie Sanders kinds of influence over the working class wanes, uh, or in our part of the world, leftist trade unions, their influence wanes, then there the working class shifts its allegiance to Trump. And here, large part of working class shifts its allegiance to people like Modi, um, why isn't the, the enlightened bourgeois liberal Democrat an attractive proposition for the working class? Well, that you will have to, for me, the answer is, would be, is that what is really the difference between the liberal working class and how to, to what extent is it prepared to, uh, to, to fight seriously against uh, the far right? And today, what has also happened is that the center of gravity of what is called the liberal middle class or of the liberals, full stop, forget about liberal middle class professionals, others and all that here, has also shifted to the right. And the most important example for this is not so much at the level of normative theory or normative values like democracy and all, but at the level of the foreign policy and economics. Where is the serious, uh, 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 and even their, their representatives, whether it's Anthony Giddens and others talking about the third way and all that, et cetera. What is it? It's a, it's a, it's a, a coming and accommodation and saying that humanized neoliberalism. Huh? It's what has been called uh, in the discourse, social liberalism, the focus on gender and independence and this and that, et cetera. But you leave the economy and you leave foreign policy alone and foreign policy, the dominant current from bloody God knows when. Huh? 
and unfortunately, even among Stalinists and, and Maoists, etc. Huh? Well, in the case, in the, case of, uh, uh, the bourgeois and the liberals, etc., has been liberal internationalism. Huh? Oh, yes, the United States makes terrible things and makes mistakes and does bad things, but we need some kind of a liberal hegemon, huh? uh, 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 hegemonic stability, huh? because that is the necessary condition for other public goods. So whether we like it or not, the United States or some collective hegemon at the international level or a single hegemon or a collective hegemon or some kind of hegemon has to be able to provide the necessary, uh, 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 what do you call it, condition. And you have found one time Marxists at the, I mean, when you talk about the working class and all, huh? well, that's okay, that's their Rust Belt jobs. You have somebody who's prom promising that they've shifted um, uh, their hair, but the shift is not as great. And you said far left and, uh, and um, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, just a social Democrat. But if we had been able to run, would very likely were defeated Trump. And that would have been something of advance. Why didn't he succeed? Do you know the most important reason why he didn't succeed? The Democratic Party screwed his possibility of candidate. And do you know what was a very important uh, uh, dimension within the uh, Democratic Party that fixed, uh, that made it, made it easier for uh, Hillary Clinton and others to uh, uh, forget about uh, uh, Sanders? The black lobby within the Demo uh, Democrats. The upper class and the middle class blacks who found themselves a very important influence within the Democratic Party were dead against. Were one of the single most important common, not the only one, but they were also over there. All this whole, uh, so I mean, uh, that's a different point. But uh, I was coming back to this uh, liberal internationalism uh, uh, here. Let me give you an example of a person whose work uh, on, on the question of democracy. Oh, take for example, a, a former Marxist who now talks about cosmopolitan democracy on a global scale, hmm? but within the framework of capitalism. Or let's take a person who writes very uh, authoritatively, very positively, and is a very good philosopher huh? um, uh, uh, and very severe critic of, uh, uh, of Modi and all. Huh? I'm thinking of a person who was uh, once chancellor of Ashoka University. And I think he may have even uh, spoken over here, right? And very good things, et cetera, et cetera, here. But what is his attitude on foreign policy? He's one of the authors of the strategic uh, non-alignment too. Yes, we must continue with the, we must maximize the strategic economy, but no outright condemnation of the United States of America. We are being realistic. Huh? And now the question of the economy, well, social democracy, within the framework of capitalism. So you can see the shift there. Huh? That's bad enough for the far right. Then you still go after them. Huh? So fine, they're allies and specific struggles. This thing here. But where is that larger context? You have to make up your mind. And that's really the whole question um, uh, of, of, of capitalism. Hmm? It's, uh, you have to be very uh, clear about it. It's not in, uh, and it's not even enough to be an anti-capitalist. You have to think in terms of what are the alternatives towards that? How do we move towards it, etc. Huh? And then, of course, and that becomes. A, but having said that, let me be very clear that since it's a long-term struggle, the struggle for all kinds of progressive reforms, cultural level, economic level, political, democratic level, we continue to fight with other allies. And even as we have our differences with them, let's always understand that we must maintain our differences, we must advocate, but when we are collectively fighting with each other, the principle of unity for those particular struggles are more important than the principles of difference. We don't mean you maintain your difference, but you recognize it here. And this also becomes a matter of simply how you behave, the tone, the language, the words you use how you criticize your allies, this, that, et cetera, all of these things here. One of the most remarkable things about the farmer struggle, which they have provided an example to the trade unions and others, et cetera, is how in spite of all kinds of differences huh, with people on the, uh, on the far left, Ugrana uh, uh, and others, how they maintained uh, 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 the, the, a collective uh, organization within the, um, the Samyuk Morcha, uh, SKM uh, and, and came together 
with decisions which had uh, a, a substantial collective backing and how they were able to do that. And of course, uh, 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 very important is that, uh, and this is a point which is connected to the question of uh, uh, the relationship of ideas and a relationship of intellectuals and others to the struggles that take place. Um, if you are uh, too far away from struggles, sectarianism becomes a problem. Hmm? If you're small and you can't influence the struggle which is too far away from you, then you want to distinguish yourself from those who are closest to you. Huh? So it becomes sectarian. If you are very close and involved in the mass struggle, the, the danger is one of opportunism. These are two dangers that we have to be handled in practice huh? by sections on the left. That is sectarianism and that of opportunism. Huh? And um, yes, uh, 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 but of course, uh, that's something which is also there, et cetera. We just have to do that. But this question of unity and outflanking, united fronts, how we find this thing, all that is, um, I think, um, uh, very important. There's one question that. Uh, yeah. One, one last question, uh, but I will take up. Uh, Smriti wants to know uh, Hindutva is obviously an extreme, but how big, an, big of an identity does India have when oh, Hinduism okay. is striked out? Oh, what? Uh, Hindutva is obviously an extreme, Yes. but how big of an identity does India have when in Hinduism is striked out? Hinduism is removed. That, that, that is, uh, that, that's the question. I did ask, I just had the last question. If Hinduism is? Striked out, striked out. If Hinduism is striked down? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But who wants to strike Hinduism down? Who wants to strike religious beliefs down? Let me be very clear about what religion is. Huh? Forget your religious intellectuals who talk about this, this thing here. Why are most people religious? Simple question in India. Hmm? The reason why the most people are religious is very simple. For health, that may help me here. Yeah? For wealth, right? It gave me more blessing, uh, Lakshmi, whatever. Huh? For power, are you please uh, fix my neighbor who is troubling me or bloody, uh, give me the power to do well in my exams and fix my teacher who doesn't like me. Huh? Health, wealth, power, solace. How do you cope with the death of a loved one? Is Marxism going to provide you? Huh? Solace. Fifth, a sense of community. You're part of a community. Is this here. Sixth, a moral guide. Huh? Huh? Seventh, a sense of immortality. Are, I may die, but my soul will live on. Huh? Why do people be hung up? about having giving birth to children and not adopting them. Because that child, male or female, has something of me. Hmm? One thing, religion, gives you all of these damn things. Huh? Why should people move away? And I'm not talking about getting away from Remember, I talked about the terms of coexistence between the religious and this thing. Who am I as a Marxist who's an, uh, an atheist, right? Huh? Uh, a complete atheist. You know the difference between God and Modi, no? Huh? God doesn't think he's Modi. Huh? But anyway, huh? <laughs> but uh, who am I to try to deprive somebody of the solace and the, uh, the ballast is this that here? But we can address the questions of health. We can address the questions of wealth. We can address the questions of power. Democracy. We can address the questions of uh, community. We can address the questions of moral guidance. This thing. We can do all of these things here, but one thing gives them here, and you're going to bond, and you want, and the one is bonding. So who wants to? And let's understand one thing about Hinduism. There are different understandings of Hinduism. Huh? One understanding of Hinduism is this thing here, here. The other understanding, which Ramana Thapar is, in my view, absolutely correctly said, the syndicalization of Hinduism. Do you know that the word Hindu only emerges in something like the 16th century? What you had. In fact, there are three sort of words. One version of understanding of Hinduism is that it is an, um, united by an orthopraxy, uh, not an orthodoxy. Many would argue, no, that's not the case. The practice is so varied, right? Then there's the view that there is, of course, the big, the, the, the little tradition and the, uh, and the 
uh, what's the other word? The big tradition. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, that great tradition. traditions. Sorry? Great tradition. Great traditions. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the great tradition and the, and the little tradition, right? But that uh, another version, Hinduism is a kind of mosaic, you know, like a patchwork quilt. But there are certain elements of unity in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, 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 mosaic. And that sense of unity is this. A fourth position, which is the one I ascribe to, Hinduism is a constructed conjuries, it's a constructed uh, development, is something that has been brought together hmm? uh, over a, a historical period of time, a sense of conscious of being a Hindu. It's basically a conjuries of different sects and practices and others over here. And look at the role that the, the census has played. Do you know that when the British left on the 1931 census, you had animists. The tribals uh, and Adivasis were considered to be animists, right? The first census after independence, hmm, the animists became part of the Hindu fold, right? And of course, you also have since then, of course, activity within the uh, uh, Adivasis and others to construct a sense of uh, uh, being a Hindu. So the census also helps to create. Uh, it's something that has been literally constructed as something that is a majority and dominant. You know? and, but now it is. It's a Sindhya. Huh? It's a process of construction. Huh? And the cultural dimension comes in when people say that since this is the case, let us give outstanding importance to construct a more better understanding of Hinduism or what it means to be a Hindu. Your Shashi Tharoor and this, that, whatever. Huh? My view is that you can do that, etc. I'm not going to uh, say, yeah, I, I have a lot of criticism here, but concentrate on the material dimensions where with this thing here and bring about greater equality there, etc. And you will find much, much significant changes if you can actually provide a kind of society in which education, in which, in fact, uh, Muslim teachers and Muslim doctors and others and others, and in which, of course, you also have um, a much greater intermarriage. Hmm? Well, today, according to Pew Research, you still have 93% of uh, marriages taking place uh, uh, within uh, uh, religions, and a very substantial take place between your, uh, uh, your broadly understood caste. Huh? In fact, one of the central anchors of the caste system is the question of women's oppression and arranged marriage. Huh? It is, obviously, because they take place over there. So you have a connection between the struggle against women's oppression and greater freedom for women and uh, the erosion of, 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 of caste to some extent. Huh? So, yes. So, and of course, we have broader caste and, and all sorts of things. But well, I mean, that would be my understanding. And if that is the case, let me leave you with uh, one uh, question. Um, Modi, Trump, and Erdogan were in a boat in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the boat collapsed. Huh? So who survived? The answer? The USA, Turkey, and India. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Achen, for this exciting, for thought-provoking and very witty presentation, very, very lecture. And uh, thanks, all, all, all of you. You uh, uh, the, the, because of technical son, problems. Uh, we, my son you know, has always say that I should be paying you to listen to me, yeah, because they say I should be quite. <laughs> so, I'm grateful you have not asked for payment from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you.